Uh, Emery was a student of mine, a student of Professor Gerald Gill, uh, whose name still resonates in these halls. And he was among a cohort of Tufts students uh, who really stepped up to the work that needed to be done. They did it as undergraduates, they did it as early activists, they started all kinds of projects. And the first project that I did with um, Emery Wright was when what is now the Africana program was the Africa and the New World program. And we were all tired of having um, students of color get to Tufts, actually most students get to Tufts, and say, why did I have to wait until I got here to know anything about African American or African history? Why did that happen? And uh, Emery and his colleagues partnered with uh, two other groups of students. And as, as part of the Africa in the New World senior projects, they built curricula around African American and African history to extend into the local public schools. So, um, Emory Wright has been doing important uh, work of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and has been calling attention to uh, critical issues for a very long time. Uh, also, while he was here, um, he started the NIA project uh, with Seth Markle. Uh, they worked with youth throughout the area, uh, so he began in the public schools and also outreached always with a focus on youth and eventually from the NIA project moved into um, his current work, which is here with um, Project South. The um, website is in extraordinarily important for all of you to take a look at, just to see that this group has its finger in lots and lots of pies uh, across the global south. There are curricular materials, there are inspirations at almost every level. And I'm sure that Emery will share some of that with us this evening. Uh, I don't want to take any more time. Um, I want you to hear from him. But I also want to, um, to close by saying uh, that the spirit of Gerald Gill is here to greet you just as it was as he surprised you in the New York Public Library. So welcome, Emery. Thank you, Professor Pinvin, who was uh, a really a source of inspiration and continues to be a source of inspiration and accountability for me um, as I walk down life's path. I would also like to thank the organizers of today's symposium um, for working to make this symposium possible. In preparation for today, I've been corresponding with staff from the Office of the Provost chaplaincy and the Center for Race and Democracy and the Africana Center and uh, specifically um, Danuta, Alex, Zachary, Katrina and all the other staff and students that had a hand in pulling together today's event. Um, I thank you for your efforts uh, to the panelists and speakers uh, who spoke before me. I was really floored by you all's presentation and I thank you so much for your words and, and leadership. Uh, Mass Vote and Youth Build were uh, both organizations that I'd already known about and, and had a lot of respect for. And being from Georgia was uh, actually ignorant um, about the campaign um, of the counselor, uh, but was really uh, just super amazed with that campaign and, and, and that work as well. And so it's an honor to be here with you all. I also wanted to specifically thank and recognize Professor Kendra Field, who I believe is carrying forward the legacy of the late great uh, Tufts professor and intellectual giant, Dr. Gerald Gill, who was my mentor. Thank you. And just a, a giant. And as I'm looking out and I see some of the students here tonight, I want to really center my comments and dedicate my comments to you all. It's, uh, I've already gotten a warm welcome from students on campus. I met earlier today at Capen House with some students, uh, and I see them here tonight, Angie and, and JD and, and other students um, who were uh, speaking with me earlier today. I really appreciate y'all being here and appreciate 
all the work you're doing both on campus and off campus, I believe that your work um, is continuing a great continuum of black student excellence that will, and you'll breathe new life and meaning into this continuum in this very significant year of 2018. I believe that we're gonna face some significant challenges as a country this year, and in many ways, our future will depend on the actions and sacrifices uh, for collective good that young people like you all choose to make in the days ahead. My name is Emory Wright, and I was born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia. I bring warm greetings to you all from the staff and members of the organization I work for and represent for called Project South, Institute for the Elimination of Poverty and Genocide. I was asked to give this keynote for this powerful symposium here today and reflect on the symposium's theme and title, The Urgency of Now. This quote from Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., as reflected on the flyer and has been reflected in the comments um, of Dr. Greenwich and, and the panelists already, uh, is really about the urgency for us to take vigorous and positive action. When these words were spoken over 50 years ago, many heeded them and were already heeding this call to action and their collective works, positive action, helped shape the world that we live in today. So in preparing for these remarks, I asked myself the question, why do we remember the words, the person, and the work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. almost five decades after he was assassinated by a sniper's bullet? Why do we have a national holiday named in his honor? A week after this national holiday, and a little bit more than a week before Black History Month officially begins, what can this memory serve us in the context of today's social, political, and economic environment? I believe Martin Luther King Day to be the most significant national holiday re recognized by the United States. I I should also note that King Day is recognized and observed in many countries throughout the world. Unlike most national holidays, the recognition of Martin Luther King Day was the result of a heavily contested, hard-fought struggle. Some of the older members of this audience and students of history may remember this struggle, the debates that were waged, the leadership, his wife, Coretta Scott King, movement organizers, artists like Stevie Wonder, who penned his song, Happy Birthday, as part of a campaign to pressure the United States government to recognize this national holiday. Athletes, um, everyday people from all walks of life wrote letters to their elected officials, attended meetings and rallies, and became part of an organized force to successfully make the powers that rule this country do something that they have never wanted to do which is face the truth of our nation's history. And to be clear, there was extensive opposition to Martin Luther King's uh, day becoming a national holiday. Senators Orrin Hatch, John McCain, along with more open racists like Senator Jesse Helms, led a campaign that reflected a larger racist and right-wing movement of opposition to King Day, and importantly, what it represented to them. This is what, is what is most significant to me because what King Day represented to both its supporters and its opponents was not about a man, and it was, it was about what that person represented. I would argue Martin Luther King Day, the national holiday, and this symposium itself represents a simple but dangerous truth. It is our responsibility to recognize and take vigorous and positive action with urgency against oppression and for liberation in all of its forms. How we heed this call for vigorous and positive action against oppression and towards liberation takes many forms and involves diverse strategies and worldviews. I embrace these many strategies and ways of honoring what Dr. King and our national holiday in his name represents, as long as we don't water down, whitewash, or otherwise disguise the fundamental truth 
that his call for vigorous and positive action was against oppression in all of its forms and for the liberation of all oppressed people. It was not a feel-good message. It was a feel-responsible, accountable, work-hard message. It, it was allow yourself to feel uncomfortable by the hard realities there, that are exposed when we embark in this struggle against oppression and for the liberation of all oppressed people. It is this simple but dangerous truth about what Martin Luther King Day represents that caused many people in, the power, in power to fight against King Day becoming a national holiday. And it is the same cause that informs why there was a growing opposition happening again today against this national holiday. This truth is dangerous, not to us, not to most people, regardless of race, class, gender, or other experience. This truth is dangerous to those who want to keep the status quo of widespread oppression and exploitation because they realize that the status quo is fundamental to their billion dollar bank accounts and they are okay with that. This truth is dangerous to that small percentage of the population because they know if we take it seriously, it will mean facing our nation's history and exposing the many horrors that are a part of that history. These horrors represent crimes perpetuated against humanity itself. If we expose these crimes, we may also begin to seek justice to repair and remedy the results of those crimes. These crimes, of course, include the transatlantic slave trade, chattel slavery, the attempted genocide and colonization of indigenous peoples and their land, these two mega crimes that I just mentioned set the basis for the development of an international economic system that guarantees oppression and exploitation. An, econo an economic system that would divide this country's new and old inhabitants into a brutal class system where the majority would be forced to work and suffer while they produce the wealth for the greedy and minority, the 1%. And of course, the crimes I feel responsible to say did not end there. Patriarchy and the gender binary and all the many horrors these concepts would produce was fundamental to our colonial and national history. Immigrants would be criminalized. Wars of imperialism without end would be perpetuated across the globe. Deceit and misinformation would become structural tools of oppression. And I'm not just talking, this you know, could sound like I'm talking about recent history, but I'm talking about history you know, from a long time ago because my point is the histories of these oppressions and unfortunately, as you know, um, this was not an exhaustive list, but these histories of oppression set the basis for what, um, what claims to be the greatest democracy on earth. So in this context, the truth about what Martin Luther King Day represents, what it means to truly honor this day and what it represents, in this context, this day is almost a coup to have a holiday in his name. A casual student of Martin Luther King's life would know that he was unwavering in his insistence and that he and all of us, uh, for all of us to face the truths of this history. What is also important to say here is that although these truths are dangerous, very dangerous, to those few who are actively and consciously invested in maintaining the status quo, these truths are shields of safety for the majority of us that contend with some of the many forms of oppression um, that exist to, uh, and are required by this status quo. And oppressed communities have used our history, experience, culture, and ideas as tools of opposition to such oppression. We have used these tools to imagine, envision, and often practice a radically alternative reality of liberation and humanity. Our positive action against this history of oppression and for a liberated future has been like a light shining 
on what is good and possible about the human condition. The truth about what Martin Luther King represents is that people have organized with the strongest form of power oppressed people have ever had, and that's the power of collective action. This power of collective action, these people, us, that is what Martin Luther King Day represents, and I hope it is what we can all remember when his name is ever invoked. Not the man, the movement. And I'm gonna come back to that word movement in a minute. But first, in the spirit of my claims about collective action, truth, and history, I want to invoke the name and words of another person, a black woman who often pushed and persuaded the actual person, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., to do better, to be more precise, more true in his leadership pursuits towards liberation. That woman's name is Ella Baker. And I don't know if our uh, AV people have that, um, clip queued up or not, but it's all good if you don't. Um, Friends, brothers, and sisters in the struggle for human dignity. and freedom. I am here to represent the struggle that has gone on for 300 or more years, a struggle to be recognized as citizens in a country in which we were born. I have had about 40 or 50 years of struggle, ever since a little boy on the streets of Norfolk called me a nigger. I struck him back, and then I had to learn. I had to learn. I had to learn that hitting back with my fist, one individual was not enough. It takes organization. It takes dedication. It takes the willingness to stand by and do what has to be done when it has to be done. It has to be. It, a nice gathering like today is not enough. You have to go back and reach out to your neighbors who don't speak to you. And you have to reach out to your friends who think they are making it good and get them to understand that they, as well as you and I, cannot be free in America or anywhere else where there is capitalism and imperialism until, 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 until we can get people to recognize that they themselves have to make the struggle and have to make the fight for freedom every day, in the year, every year, until they win it. Thank you. I think that clip, and we had some great definitions of this quote, the fierce urgency of now, but I think that clip represents both fierce urgency and now. I invoke her words and name for three reasons. First, the Martin Luther King Jr. First, like Martin Luther King Jr., she represents the best of something that I call, and many have called before me, black radical traditions of the US South. She reflected these black radical traditions of the US South in her works for justice and liberation by remaining true to a fundamental principle within this, position, within this tradition. The great movement leader and worker, Fannie Lou Hamer of Mississippi, described this principle by saying, nobody's free till everybody's free. 
Martin Luther King Jr. himself described this principle when he said, a threat to justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. But regardless of the words used to describe this principle, I would like to offer that living up to this principle in works, in vigorous and positive action, is to live up to the very best of what it means to work within the black radical traditions of the US South. This principle, if we truly believe what it means, means that we are not okay with the fact that, for example, the women and men who clean up every day at this university are barely paid enough to survive. It means that we are not okay with our undocumented sisters and brothers being criminalized, forced apart from their families, and terrorized for merely existing. It means that we are not okay with our brothers and sisters in Somalia, Yemen, or anywhere in the world being slaughtered by the bombs of US drones. It means that we are not okay with the horrific rates of trans suicide. It means that we are not okay with the systematic brutalization of black bodies in general and in all its forms as the fuel for and fulcrum of white supremacy. And as Ella Baker, clearly reminds us, it doesn't just mean that we're not okay with these and the many other injustices that surround us every day. It means that we do something about it. Let's do something about it. Powerless is an inaccurate and sometimes even cowardly response in the face of these injustices. Let us take vigorous and positive action. The other reason, another reason I invoke the name and works of Ella Baker is because her leadership interrupts a prevailing and destructive narrative about social movement work and really about how change has happened in this country. Although not reflected in the dominant narrative, it was mentioned on this panel, um, if you ever look at a picture of a mass meeting in Georgia in the 1960s, or through research, if you uncover the names of the people who sparked the Montgomery bus boycott in Alabama, if you expose the histories of how positive changes have ever come about in this country, in this city, um, and in the world, what you see across the board is women. So I invoke the name and work of Ella Baker because understanding and uncovering this truth about our history, about how change happens, about who makes change happen, is fundamental to our successful collective liberation. The last reason I invoke the name and the words of Ella Baker is my reflections about the theme and purpose of this symposium um, and what it really means for us here today, and that is about social movement itself. I said I would come back to that word earlier, so here I go. Ella Baker was an innovator and inspirer in the continuously existent and I believe critically important idea and practice that is encapsulated in the word movement. Social movements, I believe, are the future, hope, and form of vigorous and positive action that will successfully shape our 21st century world. I work in Atlanta, Georgia for an organization called Project South. We were founded in 1986 by civil rights and labor movement veterans for the purposes of contributing to the development of movement power in the US South. We believe movements always exist within society. The only question is how powerful are these movements? How organized are these movements? We work in a region, the US South, that was fundamental to the development of white supremacy, not only in this country, but globally. As we develop our work to build movement in any given moment, we ask ourselves about the relationship between white supremacy, capitalism, gender oppression. More recently, we, we have begun asking ourselves about how the legacy of colonialism impacts the lived experience of our membership, and larger base of people living in the US South today. Although we certainly do not have the answers to all these very important questions, I want to leave you 
and I'm going to open up for questions um, after this, but I want to leave you with a couple ideas and strategies that we are using in the South today to take seriously the call for vigorous and positive action that Dr. Martin Luther King made over 50 years ago. Right now in the U.S. South, there's a growing social movement connected to and learning from our brothers and sisters in the global South. It's rooted in our black radical tradition, history, and it seeks to build power towards a radical democratic vision once again. Like movements, social movements happening in places like Senegal, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Burkina Faso, Cuba, Haiti, Kurdistan, Bolivia, Mexico, we are breaking from old forms of organizing to be autonomous, self-governing, and radically democratic movements that have the power to confront corrupt politics and raise strong communities. We come together in assemblies at the community level within our diverse fronts of struggle and across struggles to build the power to demand our vision for social, economic, and, and economic justice for all. This work is not trending on Twitter. It's not even directly supported by philanthropy and is often invisible to national media. However, this Southern-based work is growing in its power to connect the disconnected, to give voice to those historically left out voices, and to network the brilliance of Southern grassroots communities committed to the history and future of our people. We are black people, brown people, youth, immigrant, queer. We are multi-generational, rooted in the past, but representative of a future that will break the chains of colonialism. We are seeking to answer the unanswered questions regarding patriarchy, the gender binary, generational poverty, and white supremacy in all of its forms. We are a current wave of a long-standing Southern freedom movement tradition. We are Southern movement organizations that are committed to breaking down the borders of geography and difference that keep us divided and conquered. We're named the Southern Movement Assembly, and we are building our power from the bottom up to confront this moment and realize our liberation. The great Kenyan writer, thinker, and activist Ngugi Wa Thiongo has said that if colonialism is fundamentally about breaking apart, breaking apart people, breaking apart land, breaking apart bodies, breaking apart cultures, then decolonization is fundamentally about putting back together what's been broken. It will be a new form when we put it back together, but it's about re, you know, imagining and reconnecting what's been broken. Social movements like ours all over the world are growing in our power and sophistication to make decisions, implement those decisions, govern geographies, and build infrastructure for communication, education, healthcare, and other service provision. We believe, and I would offer to you all here today, that social movements can reimagine and remake the world of widespread oppression and, exp and exploitation that exists today. There are growing social movements and entry points into this social movement work, and we heard about some of that here on the panel, right here in Boston and in urban and rural areas all over the country. Many of these movements are connecting to the historical continuum of the places they work in. Much of this social movement work is organized in ways that are much more inclusive and democratic than ways we have organized our liberation struggles historically. And all of these social movements need people, need us to take vigorous and positive action to build the world that centers the liberation of all oppressed people. We are stronger together, let's join together and build this future we and our future generations deserve. Thank you. So um, 
Uh, yeah, I just wanted to take a few moments and take questions. I think there's um, some microphones, but anybody who has questions about anything I said or the work that we're doing in the U.S. South today. Hi, Ray. Chris Cato from Youth Build USA. I, I don't know, very basic question, but I, I'm, I grew up in the Northeast, and one of the things that we would say in, in the Northeast is that <clears throat> prejudice are invisible up here. Um, I'm just curious to know how prevalent or visible it is in the South, and how does it play itself out? Yeah, thank you. Chris, and, um, and thank you for your work. Um, you know, it, it, it definitely, in my experience, I, I was born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia, came up here to Boston to go to school. We were talking with some of the students about this same question earlier today. I mean, in, in one way, I can say honestly that Boston, there was more overt racism in some ways um, than other places that I've lived in the South. Um, it was, when I came up here, um, it was before the gentrification that I think has happened in um, South Boston had taken place. I don't know what it's like now, but I was told by Boston residents not to go to South Boston. Uh, it was a place where I experienced, um, um, you know, the feeling of walking into places and not being welcomed. And, uh, and so, but, to your point, it was very different from what I experienced in the South. You know, in the South, we have symbols um, that might prevent you from even walking into that place um, before, you know, in advance, like a, like a flag, um, a Confederate flag. So you don't even, you know, it kind of saves you the uncomfortability of walking in and, and being like, I'm not welcome here. They do not want me here. You just know in advance. So, so I think that um, all of these... Um, these sort of prejudices and, and different forms of oppression, um, you know, in my experience, play out differently. One thing I will say is uh, over the last eight years, nine years, there has been a concerted effort, a very well-funded effort, to tap into the legacy of sort of white supremacy, Southern style, and, um, and export that nationally. And, and so it's been um, through the use of radio, and it has really created a situation where you even have children who are more overtly racist than their parents. Uh, and that's, a, that's sort of a regeneration of, of hate that is um, you know, very alarming. And so that is definitely true too. But, um, but yeah, it shows up, it shows up differently. And it's, it's, we're now living in a, in a national moment and then really in a global moment where uh, authoritarianism, and uh, white nationalism, white supremacy is, uh, is, is stronger than it's ever been in my lifetime. Other questions? Yes. Oh, Professor Robinson. <laughs> uh, Where operation works. So it sounds like networked. And you're saying it's global. You, min you mentioned some places like Senegal, Somalia. Do, is there like a, a central, do you have an annual or biannual conclave where people come together? Is it uh, online? Do you connect, can individuals connect with you or do you have to be part of a group that's becoming a movement? Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. And it's uh, great to see the amazing um, Dr. Robinson, who was a teacher of mine. Um, and part of, part of honest, the honest answer, or a, a sort of pre-answer to your question, is I really learned from a class of yours how easy it can be to connect globally. I, I took a class, uh, I think it had to do with a sort of regional um, regional associations um, in Africa and and but in the class we were and this was you know I graduated in 99 so this was right around then 
we were able, we, there was a, a corresponding class happening at the University of Makerere in Uganda that was reading a lot of the same materials we were reading. And then the internet was not what it is today, but we were still able to communicate with those students across the Atlantic Ocean. And, um, and that was a really powerful example that stuck with me that it's a lot easier than we can sometimes um, think that it is to make these global connections. And, and so how Project South works is, uh, or how this Southern Movement Assembly process works, it was really born out of our experience with Hurricane Katrina. In 2005, I was younger than I am now, and, um, and I, was, I was sort of on the front lines of responding to this uh, horrible, horrible disaster where people were suffering, uh, people were dying, and we really saw as frontline organizers the level of the water in terms of social movement and our inability to respond in a way that was commensurate with that scale of disaster. And so we sort of made a pledge to ourselves as young people that it was part of our life responsibility to figure out how to build a form of of movement governance that could respond to that scale of disaster. And so it took many years after 2005, but, but in 2012, we launched this Southern Movement Assembly, and we actually launched it at the historic site in Lowndes County, Alabama, where the Lowndes County Freedom Organization uh, camped out for uh, years, really, um, in response to some of what they were fighting at the time, Lowndes County as quiet as it's kept, is the, um, the birthplace of the Black Panther Party. And um, they had a Black Panther Party that, uh, that elected officials there locally in Alabama. And, um, and how, how it's come to sort of evolve since that time, since June 2012, on every Monday at 10 a.m., a group that we call ourselves the Governance Council of the Southern Movement Assembly meets. We've probably missed under 10 Monday since um, June of, of, of 2012. And that's a form of infrastructure in itself because we're, there's a rhythm to it. We're always meeting um, on, on this Monday morning. There was a meeting this morning. And so that's the Governance Council. The job of the Governance Council is to implement the decisions that are made in an annual or, uh, or sometimes it's more than once a year assembly that we have. So we have these great big Southern Movement Assemblies where activists and organizers come from all over the region, all 13 states of the US South, and uh, mostly represented though either by an organization or representative of an organization or of a community. Those are the sort of delegates at these Southern Movement Assemblies. Together we make a plan of action for the following year or the following three months, depending on what's going on around us. And, um, and then the Governance Council implements that decision between assemblies. So we have 17 organizations that are part of the Governance Council, and we have about 60 organizations that are participating organizations throughout the region. And um, that's a little bit about sort of how we operate. At this last um, Southern Movement Assembly, we had a representative from the Lucha Movement in the Democratic Republic of Congo to, who wanted to learn a little bit about how we were working and we wanted to learn a lot about how they're working because they're uh, a, a major force that is contending with um, trying to get the head of state to do what he said he was gonna do over there in the Democratic Republic of Congo and, and step down. And, um, but they're also trying to remake the country and they're also organizing through assemblies and um, very similar, um, although they're more organized and more powerful than we are, um, sort of methodologies. And so we're, um, we're connecting in that way. We do uh, leadership exchanges throughout the region. When I was a student here at Tufts, um, one of our other mentors who's um, passed away, George Davis, my, my uh, co-student and, and uh, person we were helping to organize NIA project, Seth Markle, we were always talking about Africa. And, um, and George Davis said, you can also talk about the Caribbean, you can also talk about uh, South America. If you're concerned with black people, there's black people um, um, both in this hemisphere and on the continent. 
And, and that has also been a lifelong lesson that stuck with me. And we do uh, sort of leadership exchanges and um, there, we have a project called the University Sin Fronteras or the University Without Borders where we do leadership ex exchanges in Puerto Rico, in Cuba and uh, Mexico and, and other parts of, of this hemisphere. So there's multiple ways where we sort of connect and try to break down the borders that divide us. But I think what, what sort of across the board in, in these new movements that are happening globally is we're all rooted in a place and we're rooted in the continuum of that place and we use that as the basis to connect to other places. Any other questions, any, any of uh, the students here? Um, questions even not related to, um, to the work that I'm doing, but questions that are related to y'all's experience here on campus. Yes. Thank you. Um, the question that I had is one that I've been thinking a lot about throughout this entire symposium. We've heard a lot about engaging the other, right? Someone who's very different from us and the importance of coalition building. But something that I've um, really seen and struggled with is how do you engage members of your community, uh, specifically minority communities, that are overcome by that feeling of powerlessness that you spoke about? And that's really, I've noticed, it's very linked with this notion of self-hate and self-sabotage. And so I wanted to ask, from your experience and work, what have you found successful methods of addressing that issue? Thank you for your question. Um, yeah, one thing I think that is powerful in overcoming that is just through creating space where we can learn the tr real truth of our history. And I was, I was sort of speaking to that, that point earlier. I think our history is filled with examples of overcoming um, very, very, very difficult situations. And so Project South in our educational work, we really focus on using history as a tool, not only to understand what's happening around us, but as a tool for self-love and self-empowerment, uh, because that is, that is key. I also mentioned Ngugi Wa Thiongo and the, um, his, you know, and I, I mean, I was paraphrasing, um, but his ideas about decolonization, which we should all read, and I should even read more, because he, he talks about it a lot. But that's been another really profound thing for us over the last five years. Uh, we learned about decolonization through uh, social movements happening in Puerto Rico, in Western Sahara, in uh, indigenous sovereignty movements. They were using this term a lot more than we were in the US South. And so we started to think, okay, well, we were colonized here in the US South, but we don't, we're not even engaging this idea around decolonization. What does decolonization mean to the US South? And since that, and we're still asking that question, but we've done a lot of work to, to investigate that question um, and uh, with communities and, and with people who, um, some people who've been to college, but many people who've never been to college, uh, people who live on the street, people who um, are living in poverty have all together, we've been investigating this question around decolonization. And one thing that we've learned already is that a lot of that, those same um, problems you are mentioning around um, sort of self-love and, and, and respect have to do with an inherited colonial legacy that we have to really work to undo. And, um, and so I would say decolonization across the board, it's how we even structure events. I, I, it's not, um, I'm honored you know, to be up here talking um, to you all, but I know for a fact, I mean, we saw on the panel, there's people who have just as much important stuff to say. Um, and, um, and so uh, there's students here who I was talking to earlier who have very important things to say. And so even how we structure events and, you know, is um, we can do these things without thinking about it because it's the way they've been done, but, um, but decolonization and decolonizing our spaces, how we set up uh, rooms, we talk about, you know, um, what do people see when they're in the room? Are they images that reflect them? And all those things, it can, it, it's been a, a really profound uh, piece of work. So um, history, decolonization are two ways. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions?
Yes, sir. You mentioned capitalism and white supremacy, which I, uh, I don't. My assessment seems to be that is leaving the academic, even though this is an academic space and there's community members from not in the academy, um, seems to be uh, during this kind of Trump administration something that's in the public sphere of conversation. Um, where before I think white, so if you said white supremacy, that would you know um, cause a lot of. Um, Trouble, so to speak, for lack of better words. So I'm, I'm just wondering what you, how your organization, organization looks at um, what what it means when they say um, like white supremacy and working to undo white supremacy. Um, if there are allies that are white that do that work with y'all, or um, and also um, lastly around this time in, I guess. There's a lot of conversation on like what part, of how people view capitalism, especially in the in, in academia, like late stage capitalism and so forth, with technology and all this kind of stuff. But I'm just wondering what the conversation, since you're working on the ground with people around what is white supremacy, how do you work to undo it, who do you work to undo it with, and like what is this moment in time of of the, of the economy for people who are poor? Right. Yeah, I appreciate the question, and um, you know, I think that we are really globally at a, at a crossroads where questions of uh, governance, questions of economy um, are really up for grabs and, uh, and, and it's gonna go one way or the other, you know. But we are at one of those very unique moments in history where there is, um, it's, it's contested as you were mentioning in your question in a way that it's not always. And, and so, um, with some of the most hopeful stuff. Part of our, our work in the Southern Movement Assembly is called, uh, we have an initiative called the Southern People's Initiative. And it's really broken into three parts, building a new social economy, building people's democracy, and protecting and defending our communities. Because to the earlier question about um, what discrimination is, is like in the South, and I know now it's national, violence is, is part of the answer. I mean, I think this last national election was the first time where you could expect violence towards uh, people who are just registering people to vote um, in a long time, you know. Um, and, um, and now that wouldn't be, you know, shocking, um, if, if, as horrible as that is to say. Um, so uh, I think this, what does it mean to build a new social economy? Um, it can be building cooperatives. It can be uh, building um, uh, different sort of, monet, you know, uh, skill share uh, economies. There's lots of different um, ideas out there and practices out there. We have uh, something in Atlanta and something we're building in different parts of the South called a mutual aid liberation center. And these mutual aid liberation centers tap into the very deep and long history that really started after um, the emancipation um, of chattel slavery. Uh, there was mutual aid societies throughout the South. And these were created by people who had no capital. They had no money. Um, but they created uh, economic development initiatives that were very successful. A lot of our black banks started out as mutual aid um, um, efforts. And so I think there's a range of possibilities um, out there. And I, I, I do think that we have to really build the new as we're sort of defending against the attacks from, from the old. And so that's, that's been sort of a big push in our work in the South. And I also see that happening some globally. Thank you. Other questions from the folks? Anything. Yes, sir. Good evening. Um, thank you so much for um, everybody's contributions this, this evening. Um, I guess we started this off uh, with the panel, at least, uh, with Chris introducing um, the, 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 um, all we need is love, 
No, no, not all we need is love. What the world needs now is love. <laughs> I'm, getting my, I'm getting my tunes mixed up. Uh, and, and so I guess my question is, is, is I want to come back to that in some way and ask the question, not only of you, but maybe of the audience too in some ways, in terms of, your own, you know, in terms of our own thinking and, 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 and what we're absorbing. Uh, what is the role of love today? Uh, I know that uh, one of my uh, uh, heroes is Mel King uh, from the yes. South End. Yeah. And uh, one of his books is, uh, on poetry is, uh, uh, the title of the book is uh, 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 The Question, uh, The Question is Love. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the question is love, uh, uh, the answer is love. Uh, uh, and, 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 and so I think, I think that's very important. In, in some ways, so please. Anybody wanna, anybody got some ideas on love <laughs> and its role in liberation? Yeah, I think it's, uh, yes, Pr Professor Pinman. So as a Unitarian Universalist, that also that that's a, a faith tradition that did stand up during the civil rights and did stand up for gay rights. Uh, one of the current programs is actually called Love Resists. Um, you see those flags all over the place and, uh, and I think the strategy is that you can just, I mean, obviously King and lots of others said you have to answer with love. Um, and it's also love that makes you care and we've heard so much about conversations and understanding and engagement and you know, nipping underneath that flag. I mean, a Confederate flag, you oughtn't to go underneath that, but she did go under that flag, and that comes out of love. This is great. No, I was also gonna say, I think that love, you know, you look at different levels of love. You know, you start when you're a kid, and it's love of parents, and you evolve to friends. And, <laughs> The highest level is love of mankind, when you can love someone who is not yourself and see the humanity in another person, even if you don't like them, if you don't see them. If you believe that someone is a monster and inhuman, you treat them differently than you would if you believe that's another person. And if they're capable of that, and I'm a human, it means I'm capable of that. And in the same way, people are capable of great, um, heroic, wonderful, compassionate things. And if you're capable of that, I'm another human, I'm probably capable of that too. And I think, um, I, I so agree with you that the question is love and the answer is love. And um, at the bottom of all this, I think what we all seek in terms of social justice is some kind of an equitable measure of love for every person. I don't treat you different than this person, than this person, because somehow there's a love that transcends all the crazy and, and um, and doesn't allow me to just, you know, harm another person. But I, I appreciate your commentary. Thanks. Great, thank you. Any other? Any students have any um, thoughts on love and liberation and what that means? Can I? Oh yes, please. I, I just I have a mic. Um, when I think about love, I think I love myself. Right. That's why I fight. I love my people. That's why I fight. And this, the young lady that spoke about, I wanted to say in all the spaces that I share, that's what we're talking about, right? Self-care, self-love, right? Getting over all of the things that have happened and occurred and all the shaping that has transpired in our lives, but it's about self-love, right? Like, if we want the world to love all the way around, I think it begins in here, loving yourself. The reason we have so much, you know, we can't work together and this, that, and the other, and all the, how do I want to put it, stigmas and everything that's been placed upon us it causes us not to love ourselves. And when people don't love their self, you can't, you, in my opinion, if you don't love yourself, you can't love somebody else fully. You can't even show them how to love you if you don't love yourself. And so I think it's the basis of learning how to love yourself and self-care and building resilience and all of those kinds of things so that we can through that lens, understand and connect with people. But it's about loving yourself, too. 
That's a great, great, great point. And um, I, I'm going to come to you because I love this and, um, and we got so much knowledge in the room. I also just wanted to say with regards to Mel King, um, who's an amazing um, uh, figure um, and, and living um, amazing person here in Boston, um, I got to know through my work off campus. And, and my life changed through knowing Mel King, who as a bit, yeah. I mean, this brother was um, way up there in his age, but you would see him out on the block at two o'clock in the morning with the young people um, just hanging out and making sure they were safe. And, and, um, and he's, he's a, a real amazing person. But the reason I say that, um, not only to acknowledge Mel King, but it's also to just do a plug for, there was a call earlier um, and um, by Ms. Um, Clyburn Crawford around her Saturday youth program. And I would suggest that if anybody here is interested in something like that, those kind of opportunities are just transformative uh, to engage off campus with people and uh, you know um the the most i learned from being here was was when i would would take those opportunities so that was a big gift to the room but here uh, would love your answer on sort of love liberation what does it mean um one thing came to mind when cheryl was speaking was um a kanye west lyric where he says um they make us hate ourselves and love their wealth and i feel like when i think of love that's self-love um loving yourself and not loving things outside of you. And also, um, I think love starts from your parents and how you learn to love from your parents. And when people don't receive that love at home, um, they carry that with them in the future. And part of liberation is unlearning um, hurtful ways that we've been treated and unlearning those things and learning that we can love ourselves even if we weren't taught to and teaching ourselves that. And I think that starts at home before we can liberate others. Yeah. Let me just get some undergraduate student who say something on love and liberation, anybody, or just your reflections on this symposium. Anything. <laughs> All right, Angie. <laughs> um, when I think of love and liberation, I think of critical compassion. And um, to go to your point about family, thinking about how the love that you have for your family becomes a different love when you see them as human and you're able to see their faults and able to say, okay, you're human and you make mistakes, but I'm still gonna love you regardless. And I'm gonna work with you on those things so that we can build. So I think critical compassion is the foundation of a liberation movement Love doesn't exist without critical compassion and the ability to critique yourself and others in a loving way. And there's a great quote um, Martin Luther King said about, um, and I can't remember it so I won't try to quote it, but he basically problematizes love without justice and justice without love. He, he, I do remember that he says, um, Love without justice is anemic, is part of the quote. And, um, and, um, and, but he also problematizes justice without love. So it's a great question and a lot of great thoughts and answers. Uh, any other closing questions or comments um, from anyone here on love, liberation, the urgency of now, any of the, the, um, you know, these issues um, around what's happening in Boston today, in Somerville? Medford. Right. Mm -hmm. For people who haven't done it, I encourage you to take a walk on the Tuss Black Freedom Trail. And if you've already done it, do it again. Right. Word up. We do have a sign up in the back for future tours. If you want to take a tour, just see the desk and you can sign up. Um, yeah, and we have our, the center has their spring events, which we have some more events kind of like this. My voice is, my voice. Oh, Carrie says there's sites in Boston. So we have, we have a display map and we have an online digital map. And you can see uh, Kendra and Carrie, yep, Zach is holding it up. 
and um, go see some of the sites, like Chris was saying. I'm, I'm sorry, Emery was saying, get out of Tufts and look around. Yeah, thank you, and, um, and just, you know, a lot of times when, I won't walk out there, but a lot of times when we um, think about movement, how do we get involved? It's so big, and, um, and it can seem, uh, where do we start? I think, and it was reflected by our panelists, uh, there's so many opportunities right here in this room, the, the trail, the mass vote, youth build, um, the um, counselor um, Edwards office, and, um, and, but for us at Project South, a key concept is consciousness, vision, and strategy. And we, we say those words together, consciousness, vision, strategy, and you can look at history to see how those words relate to all social movements. There's always consciousness, there's always vision, there's always strategy. But what is almost never the case is in any social movement, that consciousness, that vision, that strategy um, is never stagnant, it always grows. And so just getting started with a voter registration project can impact your vision of what's possible, your stra strategic thinking about how to make what's possible happen, and your consciousness um, engaging with community off campus. And so any effort to get started is gonna be an effort that develops your consciousness, your vision, and your strategy. And if it's movement work, it has to be collective. And so just um, wanted to leave with that, but really appreciate people adding in from the room and appreciate being here and thank y'all so much. What an afternoon into the evening. Um, I, and I think that it was so appropriate that we end with a conversation about love because it brings, back, brings us back to um, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, whose life was based on love. He could not have done the work that he was able to do without having that as his key tenant. And so I would like to just challenge all of us to take what you've heard today, all of the wonderful speakers, the panelists, um, and make a list. Go into your journals if you journal, but just make a list of the things that you are going to do differently, the things that you are going to be involved, become involved in. Think about students those opportunities that we keep telling you about that are off campus, that you can make that trek into Boston and, and become involved, particularly with students. There's a great need for help with the students who are right here in the Somerville and Medford High School. Think about how you're going to take all of the things that you've heard today that have been fabulous and turn it into action. I challenge you, faculty and staff, to do the same. There's much work that we can all be doing here on this campus as well as in the greater Boston area. We just have to get started because the urgency is now. Thank you so much for hanging in there with us all afternoon. I'm sure that you will walk away with something positive to think about to help us to stay hopeful, because we can't do this work if we aren't hopeful. Thank you so much. We'll see you next year.